Chair of the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency. We are here today to discuss how the administration can help manage affordability of property owners' flood insurance in New York City. New York City has more residents living in high-risk flood zones than any other city in the United States. This is exacerbated by the fact that much of our property consists of older buildings constructed before the federal government's National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP for short, was established. Therefore, homes and commercial property that meet uh, building code requirements are not necessarily suitable for modern challenges like rising sea levels and extreme weather. While we cannot control Mother Nature, there are some measures within the city's jurisdiction that can mitigate excessive property damage caused by flooding while also assisting property owners in keeping their flood insurance premiums at affordable rates. To be frank, this balancing act will be tough. Since Congress implemented NFIP nearly 50 years ago to give property owners flood insurance when it was unavailable in the private market, it has been plagued with financial problems. Presently, it is virtually bankrupt. Further, the President's administration undermines efforts to study and mitigate the adverse uh, impact of climate change, efforts that could provide long-lasting protection for property owners in flood zones. Nevertheless, there are some immediate measures the city has taken and can continue to implement to keep our city's residents protected. For instance, FEMA relies on old data, in some cases over 30 years old, to map which areas are in high-risk flood zones. They base insurance rates on these maps. FEMA's latest flood insurance rate map for New York City overestimated the size of our flood zone by about 35,000 homes. That's 35,000 homes that would have otherwise be responsible for costly flood insurance coverage. This was only discovered because the city sought their own engineers to study the data. We believe efforts like this, as well as providing owners with means to elevate their homes and enforcing construction standards that meet and exceed FEMA requirements, can help maintain property affordability for our residents. Further, we call upon the mayor's administration to urge the federal government to engage in preventative measures as well, to invest in coastline protection, to build and strengthen seawalls, to study how climate change can drastically threaten the livelihood of hardworking Americans whose homes and businesses line our coasts. These efforts at the city and federal levels require a balancing act of having a fiscally sound flood insurance program implementing a long-term strategy and preventing our residents from paying for unnecessary flood insurance costs. This will not be easy, but we anticipate we can meet the challenge. Thank you to those who prepared for today's hearing, including Anna Scape, my Deputy Chief of Staff, Committee Counsel Malika Jabali, and Senior Policy Analyst Bill Murray. The committee looks forward to hearing testimony today from the Office of Recovering Resiliency and Community Advocates. Um, and I'd just like to recognize my colleagues who are present, uh, Council Member Bill Perkins, Council Member Carlos Menchaca, Council Member uh, Margaret Chin, and Council Member Minority Leader Stephen Matteo. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to call on the, administ the administration for the first panel. Uh, we have uh, Carrie uh, Grassi, the Mayor's Office of Recovery uh, Resiliency, as well as Mary Kimball uh, from the Departments of City Planning. Uh, if you can please uh, raise your right hands. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. May begin. Thank you. Catherine Gregg. My apologies. Thank you. Is this on? Okay, great. Good morning. My name is Catherine Gregg, and I am Deputy Director for Buildings at the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, ORR. ORR is pleased to participate in this hearing about preserving flood insurance affordability in New York City's flood zone. Councilman Trigger, in many respects, you touched on the highlights of the testimony that follows. I want to thank Committee Chair Traeger, as well as the members of this committee for the opportunity to discuss the city's efforts in this regard. I am joined here today by my colleague Mary Kimball, who 
from the Department of City Planning and Carrie Grassi from the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Here is how I plan to structure my testimony. First, I wanna clarify the three reasons why flood insurance affordability has become an increasingly common topic of frustration for residents in the flood zone, especially those in the high-risk areas. Second, for each of these challenges, I will walk through the key actions the city has taken to fight for flood insurance affordability. Finally, I want to explain what we can do now to help ensure residents will be able to continue to afford their flood insurance in the future. Before I begin, I want to emphasize that a key initiative under Mayor de Blasio's 1NYC resiliency program is to ensure that residents in the floodplain are prepared for coastal storms and rising seas which requires that the right tools like flood insurance remain available and affordable. Let me begin with a bit of background on flood insurance. Up until the mid-1920s, flood as apparel was covered by homeowners insurance. This was the case until the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, which decimated one-third of the nation's GDP. As a result of those losses, the private sector pulled out of the market and no flood insurance was available for roughly 40 years. Though insurance was not available, flood disasters did not cease and the federal government would step in to help homeowners with what we know today as an individual assistance. To begin to share the cost of the risk with homeowners, Congress created the National Flood Insurance Program, also known as the NFIP in 1968. Initially established under HUD, the NFIP has been administered by FEMA since 1979. Today, over 95% of residential flood insurance is underwritten by FEMA, though it is sold by Write Your Own companies, many of which sell homeowners insurance, such as Allstate, Farmers, Liberty Mutual, et cetera. You can see a description in the slide below. This history is of significance for two reasons. One, many property owners are still surprised to learn when a disaster hits that their regular homeowners insurance does not cover flood damage. Though you may have been hearing from homeowners now well-versed in the differences, you likely have many constituents who think they have flood insurance and do not. Two, the program has always been subsidized to some extent by the backing of the federal treasury. Therefore, as flooding has become a more expensive hazard, the program has been under pressure to cover its losses. The NFIB today not only provides flood insurance, but also maps flood risk and provides direction concerning floodplain management, e.g. guidance regarding building codes to ensure flood resilient construction. Reasons for flood insurance premium increases. I will now walk through the three reasons that will continue to drive up flood insurance premiums and explain the extensive work and advocacy the city has done on behalf of residents to mitigate the re increases. First, Legislation that passed in 2012 is slowly repealing long-standing subsidies for flood insurance premiums. The NFIP was generally financially stable th from its inception through 2005. While there were annual flood events, the program was able to sustain itself year over year by using the revenue generated from the collection of premiums to pay claims. Due to the unpredictable frequency of flooding, the economic impact of flooding in any given year could vary significantly. After many years of relatively low damages, the NFIP received almost eight times the number of claims received in any prior year after Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma struck in 2005. Given the high number of claims, the NFIP borrowed approximately $17.5 billion from the U.S. Treasury to process claims from those, those storms, sending the program into insurmountable debt that it has yet to recover from. Seven years later, in 2013, after Hurricane Sandy hit, the NFIP processed $8.4 billion in claims, borrowing another $6.25 billion from the Treasury. As of 2017, total debt owed to the Treasury stands at a staggering $24.6 billion. This debt reflects the gap between the premiums homeowners are paying and the actual cost the risk homeowners bear living in the exposed floodplain. Given the mounting debt after 2005, the need to reform the NFIP was acknowledged by both the U.S. Senate and the House. However, there was a failure to put forth a long-term long solution due in part to the size of the debt. As a result, the program lapsed four times during 2008 and 2012 and was extended 17 times. These lapses caused uncertainty in real estate and insurance markets. Congress thus began efforts of addressing reforms to the NFIP in 2012 
by passing the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012. Bigger Waters sought to address the financial stability of the NFIP by phasing out long-standing subsidized rates that did not reflect actual risk. The prevailing argument for the increases was that only 20% of NFIP policies receive subsidies. Therefore, not all policies would be impacted by the increases. However, Traeger, as you mentioned, in older cities like New York, over 80% of our policies benefited from these subsidies, which were based on the year the house was built. With these subsidies being repealed, homeowners have seen rates increase as much as 18% a year since 2012. What did the city do? Less than two years after the passage of Bigger Waters, the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act, HFIA, passed in March 2014. This slowed down the, rate, the pace of rate increases and eliminated the trigger to jump from a subsidized rate to full risk rate at the time of a property sale. The city's efforts to advocate for the passage of HFIA were integral. De Blasio administration officials provided technical assistance to congressional staffers and gave testimony at House and Senate committee hearings on the bill's significance. Indeed, specific sections of the bill were drafted by city lawyers. While the repeal of the subsidies marches on, it is worth noting that these subsidies were not all that generous. Specifically, in 2012, prior to the increases kicking in, the average subsidized premium in the city was $1,800, while the average elevation rated premium was $1,800 less. This is important to note as one way homeowners in your district may be able to decrease their rates is to invest in an elevation certificate which could move them to a lower risk rated rate. Second, flood insurance rate maps are depicting increasing risk. New York City has been participating in the NFIP since 1983. To join the program, the city adopted flood insurance rate maps or firms at that time. Firms show different zones with different levels of risk. The higher your risk, the higher your premium. In addition, according to the mandatory purchase requirement enacted in 1973, Homeowners in the highest risk areas who have a federally backed mortgage must buy flood insurance. Given the age of New York City's maps, an update process began in 2008. In January 2013, FEMA released preliminary firms or pre-firms for New York City, which roughly doubled, sorry, that should not say preliminary firms or pre-firms, that's preliminary firms. which roughly doubled the number of residents and buildings in the high-risk floodplain. Specifically, the number of residents increased from 218,000 to 400,000, and the number of buildings increased from 36,000 to 71,500. These incremental home and property owners would have, for the first time, been required to buy flood insurance if they had a federally backed mortgage. What did the city do? In order to ensure the accuracy of FEMA's preliminary firms, the city hired an engineering team to review them. The city found significant errors in FEMA's modeling. Thus, the city filed a technical appeal of the maps. In October 2016, FEMA announced that it concurred with the city's findings and agreed to work with the city to develop two mapping products. One, a map that reflects current risk for insurance purposes, and two, a new climate start map that will be adopted for building code and land use decisions. The city, the climate smart maps will reflect the impact of sea level rise to ensure this, excuse me, that substantially improved or new construction are built to a resilient standard and thus will incur lower flood insurance premiums. Not only has FEMA agreed to work with the city on a new mapping effort, they will also bear the cost to do so. It is critically important that FEMA's maps are accurate. Until the new maps are issued, flood insurance rates in New York City will continue to be based on the effective 2007 firms, the blue shaded area in the map above, saving coastal households tens of millions of dollars per year. The city's building code will continue to reflect the 2015 preliminary firms to ensure we are building as resiliently as possible given currently available data. Third. Premium relief for mitigation strategies is often difficult and expensive to deploy in dense urban settings. Flood insurance rates are based on the base flood elevation relative to the structure's first occupied floor. If the base flood elevations are high, the corresponding premium will also be high. On the image below, the expected height of the wave is the base flood elevation. The challenge for a city like New York is that most of the structures in our high-risk flood zones 
were built before the maps and associated building codes were in place. Specifically, more than 80% of the properties in the high-risk zones were built before 1983. One way to reduce premiums is to mitigate risk. The solution FEMA favors and gives the most premium relief for is elevating a structure. For many homes and properties in New York City's floodplain, because they are either multi-story or attached, elevation is an impossible option. As a result, the city needs a broader list of mitigation strategies that result in savings that make those economical options for households. What did the city do? In the technical assistance the city provided on Hafaya, we specifically asked FEMA to study additional partial mitigation approaches that could, be that could garner partial mitigation excuse me, partial premium credit if implemented. This work is ongoing and FEMA expects to release a report in August or September of this year. What's next for the NFIP? As the 2012 Bigger Waters Bill marked the last five-year reauthorization of the NFIP, the program expires this fall on September 30th. While Congress may be far apart on issues such as health care and tax reform, the need for sweeping reform to the NFIP continues to be recognized on both sides of the aisle. In late April, U.S. Senators Kristen Gillibrand and Bill Cassidy released a draft bill reauthorizing the NFIP for the next 10 years. Two weeks ago, the House Financial Services Subcommittee on Housing and Insurance released six sections of a draft five-year reauthorization bill that would also spur on a re-emerging re private insurance market. New York City advocacy grounded in data. As part of the de Blasio administration's One NYC Resiliency Plan, ORR commissioned a RAND report to look at what affordability meant and model out options to remedy the issue. The report utilized a metric called a pity ratio, a ratio of mortgage principal and interest, property taxes, and property insurance. Pity payments to income. That looked at the cost of owning a given home, not merely property value or income alone. This tool enabled researchers to see what small changes could affect the ability of a person to stay in their home, whether it was a mandatory rate increase or even just additional fees. Three major findings I wish to highlight here are as follows. Grandfathering, i.e. being allowed to keep your current zone when new maps are issued in properties is one of the most effective affordability tools available. Second, targeted means-tested vouchers or credits are the most cost-effective tool, more so than the existing pre-firm subsidies. Third, mitigation is cost-effective only with greater premium reductions for actions taken and grants in support. The study focused on five communities in which there is a high risk of flooding. The study also showed that the cost of flood insurance is burdensome for one quarter of households in owner-occupied one to four family residences and much more burdensome for lower income residents. Future reauthorization. The results of this study, the first of its kind, have informed affordability solutions put forward in both the Senate and House bills referenced above. Indeed, in Senator Gillibrand's bill, the proposed means-tested voucher outlined in our study was basically lifted word for word as a prudent approach to addressing this issue going forward. The city has been engaging with both the House and Senate since early 2016 to weigh in on flood insurance reform. The city held meetings with key offices in both chambers to lay out our reform principles and to help decision makers think through potential policies. We have worked closely with Senator Gillibrand's office to help craft their reform le legislation, ensuring that there remains a consumer-centric focus and that FEMA reforms simplify the program and consumer engagement with it. In addition to individual offices, the city has also routinely met with the respective committees of jurisdiction in both chambers. Back in August, the city presented reform principles to key Republican and Democratic House Financial Services Committee staff. We had an engaging discussion where the city's ideas were considered seriously and it was made clear to staff just how important affordability is. We again met with the group in March to present the RAND study to them. Further, as soon as tomorrow, a member of the mayor's federal affairs team will testify on flood insurance and the Republican draft legislation in front of the House Financial Services Committee. In addition to this advocacy on the Hill, at the beginning of May, I presented at the Property Casualty Insurers Association of America's 2017 National Flood Conference. 
Lloyd Dixon, the lead author on our study from RAND, presented the results of our study and I highlighted the voice of the resident, emphasizing the importance of addressing rising costs in reauthorization. FEMA's reform principles. In recent months, FEMA has put forward its core principles for reauthorization, which include first enacting a bill well before the September 30th, 2017 expiration that extends the program for multiple years. Second, recognizing that there is a need to increase flood insurance coverage across the nation. And third, recognition that there is interest from the private insurance market to offer more flood insurance policies. While the city concurs with the principles FEMA has outlined for reauthorization, the city has a view of reform that is more comprehensive and stresses affordability. What can you do to help residents afford their flood insurance today? There are three key actions you can take to support affordability for your residents in the floodplain. First, support New York City's reauthorization advocacy platform. New York City has proposed a robust NFIP advocacy platform that includes both legislative and regulatory reforms. Some reforms include, as mentioned earlier, expanding mitigation options and commensurate premium credits, increasing availability of mitigation funding for all building types, improving FEMA's flood mapping process, improving oversight and management of write your own companies, and accelerating the acceptance of private flood insurance alternatives. However, the centerpiece of the city's platform is instituting means-tested vouchers as an alternative to the reliance on risk-based pricing. A means-tested voucher program with mitigation credits can allow for low-income homeowners to afford coverage. Second, inform residents of their risk so they can make prudent decisions about how to best manage risk today and over time. Recognizing the need to educate homeowners about their, flood, their current and future flood risk, the city has partnered with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods on its floodhelpny.org website. Additionally, the city has conducted a consumer education campaign that included tools explaining flood risk and the current status of the flood maps and information about flood insurance programs. Finally, the city has worked with the insurance industry to develop strategies to encourage the use of flood protection in buildings. Send your constituents to floodhelpny.org so they can learn about their risk. Specifically, one of the most powerful pathways <coughs> owners have to affordability is to get homeowners in the current lower risk X zone areas to invest in flood insurance before new maps are adopted. These policies are generally about $500 per year and provide $250,000 in coverage. If a property owner has a policy before the new maps are adopted, their current zone will be grandfathered and they will incur much lower rates than if they were rated at their actual higher risk zone as they may appear on the new maps. Third, support investment in resilient infrastructure. Finally, we will continue to work with FEMA on timely certification of resiliency infrastructure as it is built to offset insurance premiums. For example, we are working with Senator Charles Schumer, Congressman Van Donovan, Borough President James Otto, Minority Leader Steve Matteo to urge FEMA and the U.S. Army Corps to work together to ensure the Staten Island Seawall Project, expected to be complete by 2022, 20, <coughs> which will protect tens of thousands of Staten Islanders, receives accreditation from FEMA. Accreditation allows FEMA to adjust its flood maps to reflect a reduced risk, thus lowering premiums for homeowners. The converging effects of urbanization and climate change present an enormous challenge to our city, which in turn will require even greater flood federal support. That is why the city continues to advocate with Congress and the federal government to better support local climate preparedness and resilient infrastructure for the benefit of all New Yorkers. In conclusion, I would like to thank the committee for this opportunity to highlight the extensive work this administration has made to advocate for affordable flood insurance for all New Yorkers. There is still more work to be done. We are committed to continuing to work with you and other partners in coastal communities, as well as at the federal level to ensure that the reauthorization of the NFIP implements measures to address affordability of the program. I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Uh, I, I just would like to first, first of all, acknowledge uh, the work uh, of your office and um, the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. It's uh, 
there's been a lot of work, a lot of time that it's clear that has been put in uh, to challenge FEMA's maps and, and to really uh, try to ensure accuracy in, in protecting uh, New York City residents. So I do want to recognize that and I, I appreciate that. Um, there were just a, a couple of things. So what what do we specifically want out of the re, out of the reauthorization bill uh, this year with, when bigger water expires this fall? What do we want? Do we want them to increase the subsidies to make sure that they are reflective of New York City's aging, uh, you know, uh, housing stock? Uh, and and also, what types of uh, partnerships have we been making with uh, cities and you know state in states in, in the Gulf? I mean, I'm sure that New York is not the only place that's in this position. I'm sure that New Orleans is in the same position. I'm sure that you know, uh, the areas by the Florida Panhandle are in the same position. So if you could just, just lay out for us in very simple terms, what do we want out of the reauthorization bill? And like, what partnerships have we made with other cities facing the same issues a, as New York? Thank you, Trigger. Uh, the key aspects um, in order of importance is not to increase subsidies as they have been in the program. Mm -hmm. Currently, the subsidies are solely based on the year that your house was built, your pre-firm or post-firm. So if you have the benefit of uh, building to code, then you are a post-firm versus a pre-firm structure, which is the vast majority of our households. That could mean that somebody who can well afford to not only mitigate, but also frankly pay for their flood insurance could be supported by the federal government with their flood insurance premium. On the other hand, we have 37% of New Yorkers who live in the floodplain who are under 80% of AMI. Those are the folks that we are interested in supporting. And we've done the back of the envelope calculation to show that the pre-firm subsidies, the blanket subsidies based on the year of your home, are more costly and frankly less targeted than what would be a means-tested voucher. And that is the program that we are advocating for on the Hill. The other things are better mapping information, more mitigation funding. Um, specifically, there's an increased cost of compliance and ICC um, allocation that you're billed for in part of your premium. That limit is currently $30,000. We think it should be Sixty or seventy-five thousand dollars, so that if you trigger um, a substantial damage, you get a payout to help you mitigate your home to a much greater degree. Because thirty thousand dollars does not go very far. Uh, we also want um, the write your own companies to come under much greater scrutiny. We did a uh, mystery shopping exercise where we found that different brokers. Um, for the same structure, we're offering, in some cases, a uh, premium for X dollars, another premium for 2X, and another premium for 3X, all on the same structure. This should be like purchasing a postage stamp. Your letter weighs two ounces, and it costs you whatever it is, 49 cents to send, right? And that is 100% because of lack of knowledge um, at the broker level, who is the person who is talking to the homeowner about their risk and about their premium, um, who doesn't understand the program adequately. On a local level, I've also been talking to the Department of Financial Services to increase the required um, continuing ed uh, hours that are specific to flood insurance um, beyond the three hour requirement once every, I think it's three years, um, so that folks really understand the changing evolution of the flood program. So one of the things we're advocating for is a means-tested voucher program to be included in the federal legislation, is that correct? Uh, absolutely. And can you just discuss the parameters of this means-tested voucher program? Who is eligible? Absolutely. So um, there's basically uh, more support that we're advocating for depending on how much income you have. So it's a graduated um, 
voucher basically up to a threshold. The specifics around um, what those levels are, uh, we've modeled out, um, and I can give you details on those, but um, we are, have used the thresholds on the pity ratio, which I mentioned earlier, that are set forward in some of the HUD programs, so that's consistent. Um, and we, you know, like a fuel voucher um, to support heating um, in your home, we think this should be modeled similar to that. So, because I, I'm just a little bit concerned that making sure that we get the parameters right, mm -hmm. um, because I, I recall when I first uh, took the helm of this committee, uh, when Build It Back was undergoing uh, reforms, uh, they were operating uh, out, of, out of these AMI buckets that mm -hmm. they claimed initially was set by the federal government and it became unclear if it was the federal government or, or the local government that created these buckets. But uh, it, it, it hurt, it, it really affected uh, many working families uh, that were waiting for a long time because they were told that we have to help certain New Yorkers first and then get to others last. Meanwhile, that turned out to be false. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to make sure that we are capturing the, the working class universe, whether you are a teacher or, you know, whether you are, you know, a nurse or, you know, that we're capturing all people. So do you, do you have any details on the parameters yet or that's something that... So the 80% of AMI, which I know off the top of my head, is 75000 for a family of four. Um, and the programs that we've modeled go even up to in excess of 80% of AMI. Right. And AMI in particular is adjusted for New York City specific uh, requirements so that right. it's, as it's said in the name, area median income right. takes into account the higher cost of living. So in your example, it would absolutely include um, hardworking teachers and police officers and so on. Um, and and, and where, how would you describe the current discussions with our federal delegation and, and in Congress? Are you confident that we're making progress, or how would you describe the, the status of our efforts right now? I hesitate because there's a Washington phenomenon which we're all reading about daily that it's hard to predict um, its impact. but. I could not be more um, optimistic based on the legislation that appeared in the Gillibrand bill, which literally took almost word for word our proposed um, voucher uh, program. It also alluded to the mapping improvements that we require. It also looked at increased costs of compliance. It, it really was the bill that we would have hoped to craft. On the House side, um, they are putting the onus of a uh, affordability program on the states and asking that uh, the state pool basically subsidize whatever voucher program is uh, proposed. So we do not favor that as a solution because we don't want um, you know, the burden of coastal uh, high cost premiums to be borne by inland uh, New York State um, policy holders. And we don't want uh, an inequitable program to appear um, with its ensuing heavy bureaucratic um, load at every you know different state that's managing an NFIP policy. It just is not an efficient way to run the program. I'm curious to know uh, also, so so basically just to, if I'm hearing correctly, we're making better progress in the Senate than we are in the House at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and members of Congress from the New York State delegation, for example, Congressman Donovan is aware of, of this. He's problem. very helpful and um, one of his staffers used to be in our office and we're in close touch. Right, because, and again, I imagine that this is not just unique to New York, that this no. is the same issue being faced in the so-called red states in the South that are facing the impact of climate change as well. This should not be a partisan issue. Um, and so that's why I asked earlier about have we built any types of relationships with 
you know, cities uh, you know, around, around the Gulf states to build a coalition to say that this, is, this should not be a red or blue issue, this is an American issue. It absolutely is an um, American issue, and right. uh, Greater New Orleans, Inc., um, a woman named Caleb Burney is leading the advocacy mm -hmm. effort in there. She specifically asked Rebecca Kagan from our um, Washington team to testify tomorrow. They hold <laughs> weekly calls um, with as many as 100 uh, different municipalities and counties um, represented up and down, in the middle, on the left, on the right, red, blue, um, all together and, and put out position papers responding to the legislation. I would say in general, we are 85% in the same lane. When we tack slightly left or right, it generally is to slightly protect the NFIP where people are pushing for a lot of private um, investment, even allowing private firms to cherry pick the least risky policies and potentially, you know, head the NFIP, NFIP down into a road of even greater exposure, um, or in instances where um, there's less of an inf uh, emphasis on um, coastal communities where there's an urban impact. So we as you started the conversation, um, have a dense urban environment and we really pound the pavement to uh, ensure that a round peg isn't tried to sort of jam into a um, square hole of mitigation proposals and things like that. And just to be clear, who would administer these, pr uh, these, voucher, these vouchers? It remains to be determined. Um, we don't think an added layer of bureaucracy should be um, part of the program. So we would we propose that just on your bill, um, it would show here is your what you should here's your risk your full risk rate. So we communicate to everybody what their full risk rate would be, and then it would show based on your income here is the delta that is covered by a voucher, which is basically the NFIP um, filling that gap, and then here is your bill. So the voucher, that, that amount would go to the insurance company to offset the cost for the property owner, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the write your own is the sales agent for the NFIP. Right. It just seems there's a lot of coordination that will be required in making sure that the correct voucher, there's a lot of pieces here, right, to make sure that they're all in concert working together. Absolutely. So no one is cheated out of any, Absolutely. anything. But of course we have to first get it done. Yes. Um, in the advocacy with regards to these reforms, I'm curious to know if, if there's been any push to reform the way FEMA uh, administers flood insurance payouts because as we learned with Hurricane Sandy uh, and as was, re was reported in 60 Minutes and other news outlets, uh, there was an incentive to underpay affected uh, property owners mm -hmm. and a really a, and almost incentivizing you know under underpaying and penalizing overpaying so uh, has that, that has that factored into the discussions with members of Congress absolutely my emphasis today has been on the affordability right. piece but the on all of the claims processing I would say the sweeping um, shift in uh, approach um, from you know, the, when you get the payments to documenting the damage, the, the burden of proof is shifting in favor of the claimant. Um, so rather than uh, all of the incentives to underpay, there's, we're pushing for equal uh, penalties if underpayment happens. Um, and Velasquez in particular has been um, very vocal on this issue and in Gillibrand's bill as well, all of her key points were incorporated. Right. The claims piece is frankly easier to get through. Um, everyone recognizes that it was downright kind of um, horrific what people went through. I mean, it was, it was an elaborate scheme. 
I mean, yes. you had engineers that actually altered reports. And, and how and why where the incentive to undercut the payment when the payment ultimately comes from FEMA, it, it doesn't ultimately make sense to me. Okay, so we're making some headway in that area Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Um, and also just to be clear, we've discussed homeowners, but this also affects renters, this affects business, small businesses as well, their role impact, because any cost passed on to homeowners usually gets right passed on to renters, as, as we know, and small businesses are also facing the impacts of this. So can you explain how renters and small businesses are a part of our discussion? Um, absolutely. So multifamily buildings, so um, of the 200,000 residents who live in the floodplain, 70% live in one to four family homes. Excuse me, 70% of the structures are one to four family homes, but 70% of the people live in high rise. Um, and in some sense, that's actually good news because if you can spread an increasing cost over more people in a larger structure, um, it's less pain um, for the individual. Um, the challenge is, of course, the smaller buildings um, where you can't spread uh, the cost over as many units. We're still talking about um, you know, premiums at the highest level in the V zone, for example, getting to $30,000 and on a large building. And that's really, there are not that many areas which are exposed to wave action, which is what the V zone is. Um, that cost pales in comparison to uh, energy costs or water costs or other costs that are passed on. So we don't anticipate a huge increase in rents for um, the buildings where you can spread this increasing risk um, across more renters. And of course, market forces come into play here as well. So, um, you know, what gets passed on and what um, just gets managed is uh, going to be up to the discretion of the building owner. Having said that, uh, there is a concern for the smaller buildings with affordable units, and HPD is running a program um, as they go through rehabilitation of the homes. There is a screen now to look for resilient um, approaches to elevate uh, HVAC systems and boilers out of the way of the water on the first floor, which will give you some credit um, and to, in some cases, um, on NYCHA facilities, for example, we're seeing um, flood gates and flood uh, almost berms on the campuses being built um, to protect the structure. But if I might just uh, pause, uh, we've seen in the past and even up to present day that sometimes building owners uh, will make these types of investments or maybe look to make these types of investments and possibly file for an MCI increase uh, where they'll say this is a major capital improvement and that's, that's why we have to increase rents and in buildings. Mm -hmm. How are we making sure that that's not the case when it's in their interest and in everyone's interest that people are safe, resilient and, and staying in, in affordable apartments? So I, I don't think we can, um Many of these buildings are in disrepair, are a, a state of great disrepair yeah. even before you get to flood insurance. Right. And in those instances, it is not flood insurance that is tipping the scales. Um, so I would say it's, it, it will be a contributing factor, but if you, you know, had a bucket of water, it's a couple of um, drops. So I would look at the general um, quality of the structure um, in the first place. I have makes. a couple more questions and I'm turning over to my colleagues. Uh, also in our discussions with, with regards to, to uh, some FEMA reforms, um, I'm wondering if we've also asked them to include co-ops uh, to be eligible to receive FEMA assistance. A as you know, we face the issue where the <laughs> it seems that the federal government has no idea what a an urban city looks like, feels like, and they listed co-ops as corporations ineligible to receive assistance. Meanwhile, these are people who are working class people who are facing the brunt of 
both recovery and the cost of recovery. So are we making any headway on, on, on that front? So you're speaking about sort of the eligibility rules um, that flow through CDG, CDB, CDBGDR uh, money, which is a separate, um, a whole separate can of worms um, than what we're addressing today. Right. Um, we, my understanding through HRO's work and others is that we have a long, long list of um, advocacy in that regard, which is separate. We can get back to you on um, whether the co-op and I know some nonprofit and others are also. Well, I mean, I, I, I've raised this point and I, and I understand that this is, it's, I'll explain how it's connected in my view is that yeah. uh, FEMA still governs, you know, these flood insurance programs. I'm not sure how co-ops are coping with that today. Mm -hmm. We have many co-ops in New York City. Um, and so it's it's kind of, uh, on, on one hand, FEMA governs the flood insurance process. On the other hand, FEMA denies co-ops any types of assistance in, in the case of a natural disaster. Um, so I, I guess I'll follow up with HRO and others afterwards to see, since we're already in Washington discussing th these issues, mm -hmm has this come up and, and are we making a, any headway? Um, I, I want to just, uh, one last thing and I'll turn over to my colleagues. Uh, in your testimony, and I, I appreciate that you mentioned it, you mentioned that um, the city is working with Senator Schumer, Congressman Donovan, Borough President Otto, Minority Leader Matteo, uh, to make sure that the work that the Army Corps is doing is going to meet uh, FEMA standards to mitigate flood insurance risk. And I think that is exactly what we should be doing. And I, and I applaud the administration for that. Um, but I've said this before and I'll say it again. That type of energy coordination and focus has to be citywide. Um, in just the other day, we had a town hall meeting in Coney Island with Congressman Akeem Jeffries in the Army Corps. And it was very clear that we have a lot of work to do in Southern Brooklyn, and not just in Coney Island. I'm talking about the entire, even from my council, my colleague Councilman Manchaga District from Red Hook, to Coney, to Canarsie, to, you know, and to beyond, uh, to, to Jamaica Bay. Uh, we were, initially, we were excluded. My part of Brooklyn was excluded from a study, uh, and uh, Dan Zarilli and, and our office, and our offices worked together to include that area into the study. But the Army Corps made clear that they don't have all the adequate funds to actualize the study and the vision. So as Staten Island recently celebrated the state's portion of the funds, the governor had a press conference in Staten Island, announced over $150 million to you know, finish up this uh, seawall with the city's matching portion and the federal government's matching portion. Um, what is the plan for other parts of the city? I mean, uh, in Lower Manhattan and in, in the Big U project, there's still there's been hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government, the city's portion, and they still need more money. They're not anywhere near done. Mm -hmm. um, the Rockaways had a big FEMA project with the boardwalk, and I think that there's still some, some more work to do. But I just want to point out that in South Brooklyn, we're, we're, we're barely at step one. We're barely at step one. Uh, they did give us some sand after Sandy, but most of that sand has already eroded. Uh, so we have a study, we have lost sand, and we have inadequate funding. And my other point, which I, I see that you raised in, in your testimony, is that I'm not clear if there is coordination between FEMA and the Army Corps on what they plan to do in South Brooklyn. As you're working to get them to coordinate in Staten Island, that is critically important because we have to first and foremost better protect life and property, but we also have to protect affordability. This also has the potential to mitigate flood insurance costs. So I'm just want to just want to hear where 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 do we stand with making sure that this is a citywide vision and not just certain parts of the city. You make um, great uh, points, and I'll just start by saying that I'm the flood insurance expert, not the coastal protection Got expert. It. <laughs> um, but that said, uh, you know, the key to our resiliency program is a multi-layered defense. 
And one aspect of the city's multi-layer defense is flood insurance. Another is coastal protection. And indeed, um, some of the work that comes out of the flood insurance affordability study shows that even block level um, defenses or neighborhood level defenses should be considered with greater or at least studied to see if they are um, <coughs> effective. Uh, with regards to Southern Brooklyn vis-a-vis -vis Staten Island, in some sense we, uh, coming out of Sandy, were at the whim of the status of whatever Army Corps studies were happening prior to Sandy hitting, right? And the progression of those was, um, was just the course of time, in, in some instances, decades. Um, and as you say, uh, we've worked aggressively with the Army Corps to include CONI in the reformulation um, study. And my understanding is that there's a conversation coming up in the next few weeks uh, to discuss specific next steps on that particular topic. Um, with regards to the Rockaways, there's money um, that's going to the Bayside. Uh, that is uh, sand, it's park upgrades, it's um, clearly uh, things that will mitigate risk, um, but softer. And the way FEMA um, gives credit to coastal protection currently uh, for premium reduction is that it has to first be in place to a certain height so that it, you can redraw the maps behind it. Um, in the case of the Rockaways, we don't anticipate that the maps will be redrawn. Having said that, the risk will still be lower. Okay, I, I have some more questions, but in the interest of time, I will turn over to my colleagues. Also, we're in our, we've been joined by Council Member Eric Ulrich, uh, but first question goes to Council Member Chaka. Thank you, Chair, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Director, for being here with us today and talking about a very, very important question uh, about the affordability of, of, our, of our zones. Now, I, I think I want to step back and, and again, I, I have to say thank you to the Chair for really kind of drilling down. This is incredibly compli complicated stuff that we're talking about here, and it gets more complicated when we have Washington and the federal government where we are right now, so we, we get that. But that is going to inform us actually about how we're going to actually respond because I think I think pointing to a couple comments that the chair made, which is so many so many of us feel like we're still in step one on both the insurance side, even though we're we're driving the legislative process and we have we're confident about even the language right now, and it's good to hear that we wanted to hear that from you because uh, I think there's some ideas to support that from city council um, through uh, through our ways. Uh, we still have to connect to our actions on the ground. And, uh, and so what I heard from you and just kind of piecing the picture, we have a housing, we have housing stock on our coastal, on our, co our coastal communities in, in New York have a, a particular kind of housing stock that are not prepared at all for what we're, we're going to be experiencing climate changes on its way in a very big way. While we can't, and I agree with the chair, we can't control the weather, we can't control our actions on climate change. And, um, and what we can do as a city. So tell us a little bit about where we are in, this, as, as in the status quo, where we are with FEMA regulations. If a storm hit today and, 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 the, and the insurance program that we have now, I, give us a picture about what would, what would be activated. We just started our hurricane season. Uh, I think a lot of us are anticipating all the numbers are coming back. It's gonna be a very active season. Um, with several storms that will be named uh, with landfall and that could that could come up to to New York tell us a little bit about what would happen walk us through a scenario without any changes from from government and where the city is ready to pre and prepared to, to respond on the insurance side uh, and any well any any way that you want to answer that question um, absolutely so first on the insurance side even taking into account the rising rates we have almost double the number of policyholders than we did going into Sandy. Uh, what are the actual numbers? That's a good. That's a good stat, by yeah. the way. What? Are, so, what number to what number? 
it's in the mid twenties to the low fifty thousand um, policies. I can get you. The so we specific. went from twenty thousand to fifty thousand citywide holders, policy yes. holders citywide. Yes. Do you have a heat map on what communities were impacted from rise in policy? We Hold have it. a heat map in um, my my report. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, Do we have that on PDF? Do we have that on PDF? Uh, it, it is available. It is available. We have, we have that. Okay, yeah. we got it. Okay, um, thank you. You don't want a heavy hard copy? <laughs> <laughs> I brought you one. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so, and the key thing that it shows is that the heat map, um, you know, it, it's, it's painful with the increases that have happened since 2012, but when it really, really gets impactful is if and when we get new maps and how far those extend. So I want to go back to your question, though, about if a storm hit. And I think, um, you know, the biggest – we, we saw pictures of physical damage and we saw um, houses knocked off their um, foundations. And uh, many of those were built originally as um, sort of beach homes that weren't meant to be – for season and indeed were not structurally sound. What you didn't see pictures of were, as often, were, you know, moldy basements of extensive row houses, which were not knocked off their basement. And this is a point that we've actually tried to make with N FEMA and the NFIP extensively, is that, yes, we incur damage on um, carpet, wet carpets, and boilers and other things. But we, in many cases, are not knocking buildings over and that we actually can withstand with that building stock more impact than many other communities which are um, you know, filled with mobile homes, frankly. And in much of the guidance, um, FEMA often references mobile homes because in many communities, that is the type of building stock that exists in uh, the floodplain. And while I think over time um, we may have to convert subgrade spaces um, to fill them in just to make them more resilient, we will still have the spaces above. And um, Mary can speak to some zoning relief to allow over time for homes to um, replace that space uh, above the current um, roof line, um, I, I am, you know, more optimistic about our resiliency um, than I would be if we had very low-lying, um, less well-built um, buildings, more prevalent. And the fact that 70% of our residents live in high-rise buildings um, that ties to power and whether the elevators and the water um, can reach um, vulnerable uh, residents who more often than not shelter in place. And our $3 billion hardening program that Con Ed has basically completed has substantially hardened the energy infrastructure in New York City and would make a marked difference if we had another storm. And just one more point on that piece is that it was a $40 billion disaster. 20 of it, half of it, is attributed to economic losses because of interruption in business due to power loss, not because of physical damage. So that would have a huge impact on our ability to bounce back after another storm. And let me just get that right. So half, essentially half of, of the damage that was calculated was just for, for business being down on, uh, and this is a New York City stat for kind of yeah. post-Sandy. <laughs> post-Sandy, okay, that's helpful to understand. And with the Im investments, Con Ed and the infrastructure, that has been hardened will allow us to kind of bounce back qu more quickly. That's that's the that's the hope. That's design. That's that's the it's the design. That's I mean, the plan. We this isn't a 
um, hearing about um, hardened um, energy infrastructure, but I could show you pictures of you know, walls that have been built around substations mm -hmm. and uh, switching gear that has been raised you know, 10 feet up in the air so it's well out of the floodplain. And I, I don't want to take too much time, but I, I, I want to kind of develop a narrative here that it's going to be helpful for us to talk about when we go back to our districts. And I'd like to kind of hear more about the zoning, zoning relief. There were some zoning measures that were taken immediately after Sandy. Uh, we all worked on that together, I remember. Are there any other ideas? That's a municipal action. That's something that we can take, take and move forward. So we want to hear from you on, on zoning. Uh, and, and, and then also, I want to hear a little bit more about the brokers issue and the issue with brokers. Uh, how much of that is an impact and, and, and really what's the loss there if we can, if we can and your recommendations to really solve the broker issue on the ground? I'll let Mary take the zoning. Sure. So, yes, thank you. Um, and as you mentioned, there are zoning rules on the books now um, that we worked with um, uh, with the council on developing. Um, and largely those are addressing the major barriers that we found in terms of buildings being able to retrofit and to build new to FEMA standards. Um, but we are, you know, continuing to look at those, those rules that we put in place and make sure that they, they are working. Um, and we've, we've launched an effort and we've met with your office as well as many of the offices on the council about our process to update and refine those. Um, so we'll be working over the next year to continue to do additional public outreach to understand additional zoning issues. Um, and then we intend to update um, and make permanent the zoning changes that are in place now. So we're developing them and they're on their way. Well, there, There's there are now rules that are, about. yeah, there are rules that are on the books now, but in terms of updates to them, we've identified a few issues, um, but we really do want to sort of look hol holistically at the issues and also hear from people about barriers that they're experiencing um, so that we can make sure that the rules that we put in place um, are, you know, holistically addressing the challenges that, um, that zoning can address. The broker issue? So this is a naughty one um, because it's uh, somebody who's far, many layers distant from core pieces of important information, right? Because you have FEMA um, who administers the program and you have all the write your own companies and then you have maybe their sales forces or maybe independent brokers who are selling this product. And in many cases, um, the mind share that these individual brokers put towards flood is 3% of their portfolio, 5% of their portfolio. Mostly they're sen selling homeowners policies. So to have them aware of all of the naughty changes that I've just walked through oh, in just four years, right? We have increases of 18%, increases of 25%. We have fees of $25 for primary homeowners that were added to the policies after Bigger Waters, $250 for um, businesses. All of this complicated stuff, they come out in six month, a, a six month pacing basically in October and April um, NFIP releases updates to the program. There is no way, it is hard for me to stay on top of this and I basically am paid to do so let alone somebody who's selling the policies to homeowners in the market. The key pieces of information that we've been trying to convey to brokers, and I've done um, some just 101 presentations to uh, basically like industry association meetings um, of brokers in the city um, is the update on the maps because many of them think the maps have already been adopted and indeed I think that part of the reason we've seen an increase in uptake is that people were told falsely that it was mandatory. That's an okay error when it, it's a relatively affordable product and frankly a good return on investment because even though the current maps show a uh, smaller area of high risk. Sandy inundated an area even beyond the preliminary firms. And as we've seen over rainstorms over the last month, 
you can be well inland and have flood damage, and flood is still excluded from your homeowner's policy. As an aside, I'm a committee member on the National Academies of Studies Urban Flooding Study that is looking at you know, proposals to require flood insurance for everyone because of that phenomenon. Um, all this is to say that while the cost of the insurance in that lower risk zone, which actually may not be at lower risk, should be encouraged to buy that $500 policy. Um, so so uh, just to help a little uh, more understanding for me, and, and I, I just I don't know the answer to mm -hmm. this question, who regulates these brokers? That's a good question. So all insurance is um, regulated at the state level by the Department of Financial Services. But if you go to DFS, um, they say flood is out of our jurisdiction because it's controlled by FEMA. However, they, DFS can control the number of hours that are required for continuing ed for flood. So we have actually had FEMA write a letter to the new head of DFS to request uh, extending that requirement so that the brokers are better informed. So this is more of an education yeah. uh, ploy, just for ed education. So I guess what I what I what I, what I think we should be exploring is figuring out how we can solve the issue of a, of a kind of New York State regulation around both that continuing education, uh, with the focus on bringing resources so that they get uh, and and threshold, yeah. but also figuring out how we how we create penalties around around their actions mm -hmm. and 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 it'd be good to, to figure that out I, I don't know what that looks like but I think this is a good this is a good move for us in the in the in the camp of we're not going to wait for the federal government to, to act absolutely we can do something here we can explore our boundaries uh, and, uh, and, and and act both as a city council uh, in the city and also the state and work with the uh, our state legislative bodies as yeah. well. Uh, so, if you have anything to comment on that, just on that point, I was in. I spoke with um, Assurant, which is the has the highest market share of flood policies in the city. Just on Friday, um, about holding trainings for their brokers uh, as soon as um, within a month's time. So, um, their certainly willingness, and I walked them through the Flood Help NY site, um, which they thought was fantastic because in some sense we have an aligned mission, right, to get people informed about their risk and to buy insurance uh, to protect themselves. Um, and they were open to that. So um, I think a concerted effort looking through, um, and we can get this information from FEMA, who has this you know significant market share in the city um, and then doing outreach to those brokers is a great idea. Final, final thought on this is um, I, I heard a lot, and, and for, for very valid reasons, that insurance is, is one thing and there are other teams working on other sides. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a kind of resilient side that's looking, thinking about energy and power as another group that's talking about in the, the, the flood protection and mm -hmm. mitigation. This is all, this is all one one response the the more we can protect our people lives and and infrastructure the less insurance will be needed to come back and 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 respond with 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 funding and so I, that's and that's a city issue the city can be putting a lot more funding and bringing back communities through capital infrastructure improvements and making making that a priority and we just haven't seen that uh, I think a lot of the money that's here is through FEMA, and we're working through it. NYCHA, for example, we haven't even talked about public housing, uh, is in the middle of their design. It's a massive project. They're trying to figure out a whole bunch of different ways to get maximum impact from FEMA and Red Hook East and West is, is a model for that. We, 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 I think we went beyond what we thought we could, we could get. And, and so agencies are drawing that in. But the city has yet, I think, and the state has yet to really put 
actual capital commitment to the questions that we're answering. And that's something we can do. That's, 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 we don't have to wait for the President of the United States to come and tell us that we need to put more money. I know this is, this, this is a, a greater issue and the federal government needs to do their job, but we can do something here too. And so I'm hoping that, that you, can, you can take that flag at, within the insurance conversation and push all the other teams to do something, because that's something we can do. That's on us. And if we don't do that, that's, that's on us. Shame on us if we do not put the adequate capital infrastructure money to figure it out. Uh, and so I'm hoping that, that, that that's, a, that's, a, that's a warning sign for us all as we go into this. this well, we're, today we're passing the budget, actually. Uh, but that this budget and, and the future budgets really respond to that capital need that the city can do and the state can do in a very real way. Thank you, Councilman Machanka. I just want to follow up on one question that he asked with regards to, uh, you had mentioned that there is, uh, it's not clear who oversees the brokers, that you have the State Department of Financial Services overseeing insurance brokers, but they don't cover flood insurance. So if you want to file a complaint against a broker for overcharging, because remember, the, the rates are capped, who do you file a complaint to? If you have a complaint, you file it to FEMA, I believe. Right. I'm looking to Meg Becker, who is the person in the okay. room who files more complaints on okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> on Maybe we'll, we'll follow up with the advocates on, on, yeah. on, that, on that issue. But yeah, uh, yeah we... There's nobody... Okay, so yeah, this is well. This is a this is an area of concern yes. because I hope that brokers will be good Stewards, corporate citizens. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, quite frankly, after what I saw uh, with the with Sandy flood insurance scandals, I, I don't have much confidence. Yeah. So we're going to have to really get on top of this and maybe work with maybe our city consumer affairs and do something at the local level to make sure that people are aware of, of what the rate should be because. It's one thing I certainly agree the city, we need to do everything we can to educate people about the importance of getting flood insurance before they're mandated to, because th those costs yeah. will be more expensive, but making sure that, that they're being charged what they should be charged. That's uh, absolutely, and just one point on this to emphasize it, is that if a home is misrated, um, it is still one of the triggers that can jump you to a actuarially sound rate. So um, while you can get a refund if, if you're paying too much, if you're not paying enough, um, the broker can, following FEMA's rules, um, use the misrating as a moment to move you to your full risk rate. So the mis the misrating is a is a problem um, that can really impact homeowners. And um, the homeowners left to their own devices to, to challenge that, or I mean, because if they have very you know limited means, how are they supposed to fight that? I completely agree. Wow, mm. scary stuff. Just one yeah. um, point um, in response to um, the council member's question uh, that I think is so basic but critical to take back to your constituents and that's that I have spoken to experts across the nation about how to mitigate flood uh, losses and the single most elementary thing they say is move your stuff out of the way of the water and it you know the number of homes that I went to in Gerritsen Beach after 2000 after Sandy hit that people lost you know their electric guitar or their family albums that if they just moved them up to the third floor wouldn't have been inundated. It's basic, but it's a huge pain in the butt, right? You hear the weather report and now you're gonna run down and move your stuff. To, to emphasize that point with trusted community leaders, because they don't trust me when I say it, they probably don't trust you when you say it, but if they, if the, person who's preaching before the morning of the storm or the um, bodega guy who greets everyone as they get their coffee says, move your stuff this evening. That will have more an impact. I see you smiling, but it's true. And all of the images of cars that get flooded, you sort of wring your head because that's an asset that could have been driven mm -hmm. to higher ground. And 
if we can, you know, get that message out to communities that are impacted in low-lying areas, it will save meaningful dollars in recovery. Agree. You, you just brought back the memory of when that storm surge hit during Sandy. Um, and I, I will say that was the prior administration. Yeah. And I will say that I took issue with their, I, I think they needed to do a better job of communicating that storm surge that, that day. Because earlier that day, they, it, I remember, they, it just, I, I feel there was a lot of lessons learned. And I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, next, Councilmember Margaret Chin. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the Deputy Director, Craig. Um, you just gave us a very comprehensive lesson about flood insurance, and thank you, um, you know, to the administration um, for all the preparation work and all the work that's been done on this. And my takeaway is that looking at the history of this flood insurance, I think it's really so important to educate the consumer because the private market I mean, they pretty much have abandoned um, this area. And of course, if there's money to be made, they'll come back. Um, but ultimately, it's the government uh, who's you know, taking care of his people. And so I think we, we really got to get the word out there. Um, I, was, I was hoping to really urge the administration to help develop some very simple information sheet to really explain people, you know, what is flood insurance? How you know how much do you need, and how do you purchase it, and what questions to even ask the broker, uh, your insurance broker? Um, I think on the city level, we definitely should work together with the um, chair with the Department of Consumer Affairs um, to make sure people also have this information. And when you were talking about you know letting people reminding people on the day, I think that's something the city can do as a whole. You know, when you not do the notify NYC um, alert, could remind people to move your stuff to higher ground, your car and your, your belongings, your, your treasure things. Um, so I think that's something that we can uh, do that on a, a regular basis. But really looking at the, the issue of affordability, we just want to make sure that homeowners don't just get like hit with a huge amount of costs, because that's what happened after Sandy. I mean, we have like high rise building in my district. The, the flood insurance just double and triple, which was so ridiculous. So we just have to make sure that people know, you know, how do we lower the risk factor? And the amount of money that the government and the city's investing in all these resiliency effort, that's supposed to help us lower the risk, right? So we should really make sure that people understand that and that there is some coordination in terms of what the city is doing um, with all the, the flood protection that we're putting in place, that the understanding is that the benefit, one of the benefits will help lower uh, flood insurance because it will lower you know, our risk. And also with NYCHA, what's happening now is that FEMA money is, is coming in and you know, certain buildings are being protected and we still have to kind of work out, okay, if this building is closer to the water, they get the gate, but the building you know, further in is not getting, the water is gonna travel there. So I think there's gotta be more comprehensive look in terms of how to protect the whole area, um, not just the building that is uh, closer to the water. The one that's inland is also gonna be affected. If you block the water at a certain point, unless you block the whole thing. Uh, so I think a lot of that discussion is happening in the community uh, with ORR, and we've been having a lot of um, community-wise meeting, you know, on the east side, on the west side. We just have to sort of bring all that together. And the, the issue with the flood insurance is not just the, the one, two-family home or even the small building. We have a lot of old tenement building. In the low east side, a lot of them were impacted. They didn't expect it. A lot of buildings were flooded. And in my district, South Street Seaport, we have a lot of historic buildings um, that are very you know, valuable and they're very old. And how do we make sure that they're protected and also their insur insurance rate is not gonna go 
sky high because they are so close to the water. So I think we have a lot of work together to do. And we're on the city council, we're willing to help. Uh, so, but it'll be helpful if you can give us simplify information that we can pass on to our constituents, one page things, you know, things that can, um, we could translate into different languages, or the city should be able to translate uh, to get it out there to different community, things that we could put in our newsletter um, to really get the word out there that this is something that everyone should be aware of. You know, what is flood insurance? Why is it not part of a homeowner insurance? Um, so those, I think that would be uh, helpful going forward. You make some excellent points, and I um, agree wholeheartedly. Uh, DCP has info briefs in six languages on um, all of these topics, and indeed some of the images from the testimony are slides which I give in community board meetings and walk through in a, in a very measured way the complex history that informs where we are um, today with regards to this program. Uh, in terms of two specific programs and things that you can point your constituents to, I would point to one, which is the building acceler uh, the retrofit accelerator, which is the Mayor's Office of Sustainability's um, program to retrofit uh, buildings that use a lot of um, energy actually to mitigate their u their production of greenhouse gases. For buildings in the floodplain, they tie those to the co-benefits of boilers. So if a recommendation is to get a new boiler uh, because that is um, more energy efficient, it's al there's also recommendations on where to put that new boiler. So that is a particular program um, that's available for um, technical assistance to retrofit buildings to make them more energy efficient and more resilient. The second thing that I would point you to is, uh, which I mentioned briefly, is the floodhelpny.org website. Uh, this is a program that is providing residential technical assistance programs to do audits um, for homeowners um, and multifamily buildings uh, to walk them through what the exposure is and what are some of the actions they can take to make their buildings more resilient. We spent $750,000, uh, 700, a quarter, quarter of a million dollars on an outreach um, uh, consumer education campaign over the fall and spring um, to get the word out. At the bottom of the home page, there's a very um, user-friendly address search where you can see your building um, in its current map and on, its, on the future map. Um, it tells you your base flood elevation. And within that site, there are key um, guidance on just in the discussion on the brokers, what to ask your brokers um, and what kinds of uh, information you would want to bring um, to that conversation. What I'm requesting is all that on a simple one-page things for us that we can actually hand out to people. Um, I think that would be um, helpful. Um, so I think OR should put that together for us and we can definitely pass it along. We have some ma folding maps. I don't know if somebody wants to we, we have some of that collateral already, and we're happy to get you um, some of that. that. That would be good. And then also, if you have it in different languages, um, then, then we can definitely help you know, get it out there and make sure. This should be you know, general public knowledge. Yeah, uh, there's a um, site on the homepage of the New York Times at the moment that talks about how to buy a house, and I wanted to write the editor and say, top question should be what's my current flood zone and what could my future flood zone be because the folks who are potentially invest investing in areas that could be mapped into this, there's nobody in the supply chain of a re real estate transaction who's motivated to disclose that information. And I've even gone to the Federal Reserve Bank to say, you know, how can we put this as part of the disclosure process in a mortgage um, transaction 
Um, and they said, well, tell us, tell FEMA to speak to us when the maps are in place. I said, but we know that risk is growing and the conversation stopped there. But we've also spoken to Zillow and uh, some of the online um, Trulia sites that um, people go to um, to explore properties, both rentals and uh, purchases, um, to have that as a layer. Um, and they are more receptive, but they, you know, again, the consumer has to know what layers to click on. And right now they click on crime and schools before they click on hazards, right? We're generally optimistic people and don't think about the rainy day. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. And, and out of curiosity, though, is there an actual projection? Is there a range of monthly or annual costs that flood insurance policyholders uh, and future holders should expect after these changes take effect? Is there, do we have an actual number and estimate? It's structure specific, right? So you have um, the first floor of the home relative to the base flood elevation. So it will really depend on what the maps say the base flood elevation is. And for the next four to five years, we're gonna be working on the reanalysis of the current risk to determine that base flood elevation. So we, we can't project. Okay, all right. Uh, Councilman Orich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what a sort of divert for a minute if I can. I took a quick look on the council website and I see that myself, Councilmember Richards, Mark Traeger, Margaret Chin, Vinnie Gentili, Debbie Rose, Alan Mizell, um, and several other members of the council signed on to resolution, um, and I know it's not the focus of today's hearing, 624, which basically calls on the city to enroll in the community rating system, FEMA, and, I, and I'm wondering if New York City has done that, and if we have not, why that this came up a couple of years ago. Did we enroll in the CRS program with, with FEMA? So we are still in the process of exploring the CRS, and here's why. Um, since 1983, um, the city has been participating in the program. Throughout those 30 plus years, we've never had an audit of the program, which is called a community assistance visit, a CAV. Um, our first CAV light um, began in the summer of 2016 and we have been given preliminary um, recommendations, basically things we need to fix um, to address uh, really the quality of the enforcement of our building code in the floodplain. Um, that is table stakes for entering the community rating system, or the community, um, yeah, the CRS. So because um, we're still working through the CAV, it's uh, not, a, not yet a possibility. We certainly um, are keeping it on the table as an option. The one caveat, and I would say that this is part of our advocacy platform, is that generally speaking, the CRS um, program as it's envisioned is, assumes that there's sort of a thousand people, maybe a handful of buildings, and that a reasonable solution to your exposure is to relocate everyone in the floodplain out of the floodplain. And indeed, the one um, uh, community that has the highest rating is Roseville, California. It's near Sacramento. Um, they spent about $5 million relocating all of the structures out of the floodplain, right? So that tool is applied to, or that approach is the same lens that they would be looking at New York City through, which is just, there's no way we could begin to meet the requirements. And one of them that's um, probably the most difficult besides the relocating is uh, the concept of self-certification. So every job that is done, you know, redoing a bathroom or a kitchen or improved plumbing features, 
um, in our floodplain allows an architect or a contractor to self-certify that it meets the building code requirements. We don't have an army of building inspectors going out to the floodplain and checking every aspect. The NFIP CRS program does not allow communities that do self-certification into the CRS program currently as it stands. So there is a possibility that entering the CRS would cost us as much to meet the requirements in terms of people who had to go certify all of the improvements and things like that as it would in the savings. So I'm getting really into the weeds, but there's a lot of analysis um, that has to be done once we meet the requirements of the CAV. And so I, I appreciate your uh, willingness to go into detail because it always perplexed me that other municipalities enrolled in the CRS and were able to save 5% to 20% allow homeowners in within those areas to save 5% to 20% on their flood insurance premiums because the city had built a seawall, the city had built a jetty, or the city yeah. had, um, you know, moving electrical equipment above the uh, base flood elevation. So, you know, if we're spending billions of dollars on infrastructure and hardening and all of these flood mitigation projects, we should allow homeowners to realize some of those savings when it comes to buying those flood insurance uh, policies and premiums. And I know that you mentioned before how the number of policies doubled. Well, in most cases, they had to double because they were told that they couldn't get um, FEMA grant if there was another disaster unless they had a flood insurance mm -hmm. premium. Or in most cases, in my district, people packed up and moved or sold the house to someone else. And then when you got a mortgage, the bank said you're required to have it. So it's not as if, you know, 20 to 50,000 New Yorkers got up after Sandy and said, you know, we want to buy flood insurance now. No, most of them had no choice. They had to. They were either new homeowners in those areas or people who were scared of another natural disaster occurring and wanted to know that they would get some assistance from FEMA if that was the case because they had suffered Irene and then one year later Sandy. So, you know, that, that, that statistic, I think there's a lot more to the story than just, you know, what was mentioned previously. Uh, this, we have to find a way to help the homeowners save money on their flood insurance. I um, recently met with a homeowner in my district, and she owns a mixed-use property, and it went from $2,400 a year to $6,200 a year. Now, because it was a commercial element involved, the rules are a little bit different, and I don't want to get too much into that. Uh, when we actually called the Department of City Planning and said the footprint of the building is in the preferred risk zone. The lot itself and the dock behind the building is not required to have insurance. Uh, that interpretation, even when I got that in writing from city planning and sent that to, to the insurance company, they were not satisfied because the underwriter in Kansas or Nebraska, wherever this person is working, you know, basically looked at the map and said, nope, I'm looking at the block in the lot and that's what we're telling the bank. And if you don't like it and you drop or you lapse the insurance, you could default on the mortgage that you have. So there's a catch-22. There's a lack of education, I think. There's a lack of sensitivity. And I think, honestly, as great a job as I think you're doing at ORR and HRO and other you know, agencies that are trying to help people, not only with this, but with Build It Back, there really is a lack of focus on Sandy issues. I, I feel personally that the only people in the city, other than yourself, who gives a damn about people who are affected by Hurricane Sandy are the people on this committee because we represent those communities. And when I talk to some of my other colleagues even about Hurricane Sandy, they look at me with three heads and they say, that's really still going on? So they don't even realize that people are still not in their homes and that people have run out of money and that people are still waiting for maps to be finalized or for other actions to be taken by the government. That should have been done three years ago, four years ago, respectively. So it's very frustrating, and I'm not beating up on you, but I'm still dealing with these issues today with the buildings department, with so many other agencies because of the city's lack of focus and, and attention to detail here. If there's another savings program, we need to join it. My constituents pay some of the highest taxes in the city for homeowners, not talking about luxury condos and other things. They pay high property taxes, they pay high utility rates, and pretty soon they're going to be paying 
astronomically high flood insurance premiums for a house that they probably lived in their whole life or they just bought to start their family with. And I don't know that the city, I can't look them in the eye in Bell Harbor or Howard Beach or, or Broad Channel and say, don't worry, the government's got your back. We're going to do something about that. Congress is going to take a look at Biggert's Waters and the city's going to come in and save the day. I don't know that I can say that honestly because it's not true. We're not even close to that yet. So that's why I think this hearing is so important, because this is an economic reality that the middle class in New York City is going to face. And we have to do so. It's nice to talk about it. It's nice to have studies. It's nice to come back with suggestions. I want to see a concrete plan of action out of this administration that will address the looming, escalating costs of flood insurance premiums. And I don't see one right now, other than blame Donald Trump in Congress. I don't see one coming out of this administration, and I'd like to. Should I respond? Sure. Okay, so um, firstly, when you see, this is advice that we suggest you give to all homeowners when they see big jumps in their policies, is to shop it around. It shouldn't be the case, but because, and I, I'm sure you did your due diligence on this specific case, but in general, um, because of the inconsistency of the broker communication, it is worth going to two or three or four brokers to see what um, rates they will uh, give you a quote on and um, to ask them the basis with which they determined that quote so that there's a consumer education um, along the way. In terms of a plan, um, you know, I walked through, th the city has done anything but shield our um, kind of awareness and uh, understanding of this problem in order to inform the reauthorization. If and when the reauthorization doesn't go as planned, we have the playbook of what it will cost and what program we should consider as a city to fill the gap because of the work that we've done. And I, can, I will happily give you the playbook. So to say that we have not done anything and are not prepared if and when um, the reauthorization doesn't go uh, as, we will be the best prepared community in the nation in terms of understanding the cost and the risk of not doing anything. And to do something today before September 30th, before the reauthorization, would basically be potentially moving city dollars, incremental city dollars that could be spent on better schools, better uh, cleaner streets, to an NFIP solution that may be fixed by the federal government. And that wouldn't be a prudent policy approach either. So ha have you met with our federal partners? Have you met with mm -hmm. Senator Schumer, Senator Gillibrand, Representative uh, uh, from Staten Island, Dan Donovan represents the South Shore of Staten Island. He's in the majority. He wants to reform the uh, flood insurance program. He wants to help his constituents uh, maintain affordability with their flood insurance premiums. Have, has the administration engaged at the United States Senate or the congressional level our representatives in Congress who can actually do something about this? So. I would refer you to page six of the testimony, and you came in. Came I saw that. I read it. Okay. But I'm, I'm asking recently. I read your testimony. Yeah. And I saw Gillibrand and Louisiana working together, kumbaya. That's great. Lately, have you got an update from our congressional partners saying, don't worry, this is going to happen, or we're not too sure about this? I have September? whatever is the latest draft of the bill in my email as of this morning. We are in constant touch with the Hill. And Rebecca Kagan is testifying in front of the Financial Services Committee tomorrow on this issue. We are in constant. Well, maybe you can share that testimony with this committee after it's delivered. Happy to. Yeah, I'd like to read it's it. It's a very it specific response, just so you know, to the six bills that the Republican um, team has put forward. So it it behoove it, it may seem disjointed because it refers to specific but we can send you that testimony. I'm, ha I'm happy to read it I'm very interested in this issue I want to learn as much as I can about it because I care about my constituents who have lived in my district for generations and if they can't afford to live there anymore they're gonna pack up and leave 
and we're going to turn these neighborhoods into ghost towns, and we've got to do something about it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I take a quick break? <laughs> Just for a second. Okay, I'll be right back. So I think we're, are we, uh, okay, I think we're, we're getting ready to back to begin. Uh, and we'll turn over now to council member Bill Perkins. Thank you. You mentioned earlier that um, this problem was being experienced also by people in public housing, yeah, I believe. Did, did you give me some idea of the, of the areas in which you might have, that you're aware of where this, is happening in public housing, in, in, <clears throat> like it's particularly in, the, in places like Manhattan. Um, so I, after Sandy, there was a, the largest FEMA grant ever given to NYCHA housing. It's a $3.1 billion program to make NYCHA housing more resilient. Um, I have also seen um, uh, images of every single campus that touches the floodplain um, an assessment of what damage happened and what caused it and an insurance response um, basically a risk management um, assessment of which uh, buildings should have policies and which um, shouldn't so that's on the financial resiliency side on the physical resiliency side the 3.1 billion dollars as um, has been alluded to Many of those projects are in design um, to, uh, in some cases, fortify the actual campus so that you have almost a berm or a wall um, keeping the water out. In other cases, there are uh, flood walls that or flood doors, panels that will go in front of doors. Um, there are backup generators that will be kept on um, campuses and indeed um, new buildings are being erected between um, some towers uh, 
to house on higher ground um, all of the um, building systems so that if there is water, the um, heat and the power stay on. I'm particularly interested in, in the East River side of, uh, of the neighborhood in terms of some of the, especially the public housing developments that, that uh, have been built along that way. And what are you aware of in terms of uh, past flooding situations from weather conditions or any, anything like that, like the East River houses? Uh, and are you familiar with those developments? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've given presentations on flood insurance and flood mitigation in some mm. of those campuses. So uh, we know that many of them were inundated with uh, water from the East River uh, during Sandy and incurred significant losses. Uh, our office is also coordinating, Carrie Grassi is the lead actually here with me, um, on the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, which um, will build a um, fortification all along uh, the Lower East Side to protect um, the homes behind it. So if, uh, if someone from your, your office can be in touch with mine in terms of what you're doing in that regard, I, I'd appreciate it because I, I remember um, there was a big problem over there in the past uh, and it was somewhat you know, surprising because it's not only just public housing, there's also some co-op type developments over that had to go through that. And, like I had family in one of those developments. So um, whatever you can share uh, that you're doing, I'd appreciate um, finding out. Thank you. Happy to. Okay, I, I have some uh, just uh, some follow-up questions. Um, we heard earlier about those people that purchase flood insurance after Sandy. And just to make clear, one of the conditions of receiving both the back assistance was that you had to purchase flood insurance. Am I correct? Yeah, uh, if you were in the special flood hazard area then and you received Sandy assistance, then you had to buy flood insurance, yes. Right, and those, those property owners that were eligible for elevations are in theory are receiving assistance from Builder Back to elevate their home, which in theory, right, or in practice should mitigate flood insurance costs down the road or currently, is that correct? As soon as the home is elevated, they would be eligible for significantly lower flood insurance rates. And explain that process. What do they, do they call their, who do they call? How does, how does the insurance company aware that the, the home has been elevated? I'm glad you asked the question. Um, so the key way that, as I've said, that the premium is set is your first floor relative to your base flood elevation. And part of the reason that so many of our structures um, had the $1,800 versus the 1,000 is because they got these pre-firm rates, which FEMA doesn't know what their elevation is because if you were here before there was a map, you didn't have to have an elevation certificate. The elevation certificate is prepared by a surveyor who goes out to the house and measures, takes those measurements of the height of the first occupied floor relative to the base flood elevation, and then submits that, that's an addendum to um, your application for uh, policy. And it indicates, it's the key input, frankly, um, that sets the rate. So when a home is elevated, part of what they're getting, I think, is an elevation certificate. Yeah, is an elevation certificate, um, which says your elevation maybe before it was negative three to the base flood elevation and now is plus four, um, and their rate will uh, go from conceivably, you know, three thousand dollars a year to five hundred dollars a year. So, who notifies the homeowner that they should? commence this process to have their insurance rate reduced or reevaluated. How is that, or is the insurance, I mean, it just, how is a homeowner aware of this? We assume that people are aware of it, but I never assume anything anymore. In no, government. you shouldn't assume anything. So how, how does a homeowner know that if they're, let's say tomorrow their home is being elevated, it's, it's getting completed, 
what should they do to be, commence the, you know, first of all, well, what is the process to notify them that they're eligible for reduction? But what, what should they do? What's the first step? So I'm gonna defer that question to Drew Sweet, who's here from HRO, because I don't know the specific steps of the communication pathway, but I believe he does. Okay. Um, I actually can get you some more details on the specific steps, but um, part of the closeout process for an elevation or a rebuild that is uh, above the base point elevation is to uh, <coughs> is to generate what's called a final construction elevation certificate, which has those numbers that she referred to. Um, they're all written to the effective firm, which is oh, sorry. Can you hear me? They're all written to the effective firm, which is uh, what's required for the insurance companies. DOB requires that we design to the preliminary firm. So we actually have to redo those elevation certificates, but they're provided to the homeowner. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, the homeowner is instructed to provide those to their insurance companies. If the exact, um, the exact method that that happens in our closeout process, I don't have the details on, but I can get that for you. So you're not sure whether it's the contractor that tells the homeowner to do this, or is it does someone from HRO call them and say, "Hey, before we finish up with your house, this is what you should do"? I'm not clear on that. It's def I don't. It's not the contractor. DOB requires the final elevation certificate, and Build It Back also requires that that be part of our file so that we have it. Um, as to the communication, I'll get more details on that. And, and just. To give you a heads up, you know, I will be asking Build It Back and HRO that of the homes elevated, how many of them are already seeing reductions in their premiums as promised. So I'm just you know, giving some homework out. Uh, but uh, with regards to, and I'm glad that city planning is here, and we, we haven't heard much, but right, I have I have a question. Um, I know that city planning worked with with the city council to make some tweaks to the zoning rules. Uh, to make sure that elevations are made possible for build it back properties because some of them conflicted with the zoning uh, text. And I, I, was, I also understand that city planning is examining a citywide review of making sure that our resiliency efforts are not conflicting with our current zoning uh, around the city. But I, I raise this with city planning in my meetings with them and I'm gonna raise it here and this, this should not be a secret. Even if we move forward and tweak and amend the zoning to allow for greater heights in certain areas to make sure that people don't get penalized for elevating their properties. It again, the system tilts towards those who have the means to do so. Even if someone, if, if a homeowner lives on a block that has been you know, rezoned to allow for greater height to make way for elevation, and they don't have the means to do it, and they see their neighbor across the street with the means to do or doing it, what do we do? Yes, well, thank you for that question and for raising in this forum, because I think you, you know, and so as you mentioned, yeah, there's the 2013 rules that apply citywide, and then in addition, 2015 was the special regulations for neighborhood recovery, um, and that was another text amendment that we did in partnership with um, HPD and Build It Back to really address issues in um, neighborhoods that were really hardest hit from Sandy. Um, and as we look to, you know, refine and update those rules, you know, that's part of why I am here with Catherine is that we see this as, you know, sort of a coordinated approach that it isn't just about what the zoning can do or making sure that the zoning isn't a barrier um, to the extent that we can make sure to do that. Um, but. But you're right, you know, it's not the zoning can't, um, can't provide money, right? It is a separate program. So that is why it is inherently connected to the work that Catherine has been speaking to on advocacy to FEMA about making flood insurance more affordable and also providing additional mitigation grants. Um, partial credit for partial mitigation is part of that. So, you know, we're, we really see that as part of the, the whole package and are working together to make sure that what we do on one hand works with the other hand as well. Yeah, I mean, th this remains an, a major area of concern because even if we uh, move forward with tweaking zoning text to make way for resiliency, and, and again, I understand uh, the effort behind it, it doesn't 
it doesn't address the, the glaring issue of only those with the means to do it are, will do it, and those without the means can't. And the majority of our people cannot do that. And so even if we grant them the permission to do so, I mean, I, I, th this is an area that I think we, we, we need to work on locally uh, to see what incentives, what form of help can we provide for very vulnerable homeowners. I don't know if you have, have a comment on that. I, my only comment is that there are um, technical fixes besides the most expensive um, path of actually elevating the structure, which can be helpful to relieve um, the flood insurance premiums. And by that, I mean, if you, in, it's a much less expensive sort of $10,000 um, mitigation strategy of filling in the lowest floors and putting in flood vents versus the hundreds of thousands of dollars that it takes um, to elevate the structure. So there are some um, technical fixes that can be used uh, as a half step um, that will give you great relief by changing the reference floor because if you have any sort of subgrade space and you are able to fill it in or and put flood vents in, it can move that reference floor you know, a full story um, and can make a difference. Let me just, uh, I remember at, at another hearing that I chaired, I think, I think it might have been with Health and Hospitals, but the city, for example, with public housing, I know, I, I learned that the hearing has about 20 insurance companies it deals with. Are we now required to purchase or did, did flood insurance for our public housing stock in New York City that's in the flood zone, flood risk area? Uh, do, do, do you know this? Uh, so. I think what you're asking, we do have NFIP policies on um, NYCHA facilities, and we have invested in more since Sandy. I think, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, I, there's another question as to whether we should buy insurance on all of the um, assets that receive public assistance. And um, on that question, basically, um, we got a waiver from the state because there's not enough insurance in the commercial market to allow us to um, feasibly buy it at a reasonable rate, and that's an allowable exception. So in our public housing, we have purchased flood insurance, mm -hmm. but not On the all FDR, we don't have insurance on the FDR. Is sort of what I'm trying to say. Right. So like, my, my, my issue is that, though, does the federal government require us to do so, but you're saying that we can be granted a waiver? Yes. And these are only for city assets. This does not apply to any... It's, some, it's anything that got public assistance dollars. Public assistance dollars. I, I believe, yeah. All right, because I think this is, you know, I'm trying to figure out uh, if the city has been working with good, honest folks in the, from the private sector on that front that we could share with the public that you know, these are companies that have so far been good corporate you know, citizens uh, that the city purchased what important because I am concerned about people being on their own going out into this market and, and trying to purchase what insurance, uh, not knowing you know, if they're being overcharged or not. Um, if any type of information that we can provide on that, on that end, I think that would be very, very helpful. Um, but I, I'll, we'll, we'll follow up on that. Um, I also just want to note, uh, I know Councilman Ulrich mentioned the, the issue, you know, what are we doing with our federal partners now? Um, and as you noticed, as you noted that uh, my office was scheduled a meeting, I think with ORR and Senator Schumer, Congressman Jeffries, and even also Congressman Donovan, another meeting to discuss um, the infrastructure spending bill that's making its way through Congress. I do want to just note, and I know, I know you're not a member of this, but the mayor's federal affairs team has not contacted me about this. And I do think we need to work together on this issue. Um, the issue of flood insurance, obviously, is, is of critical, critical importance. And, and I want to say again on the record, I think that your office, your team, has done a really, really good job. It's, this is hyper-technical stuff, um, and I, I want to credit you on that. But as far as getting support 
on pushing for infrastructure monies from the, for Army Corps projects, particularly in my part of Brooklyn, New York, I, I'd like to have some greater support on that. And uh, I have, to date, not been contacted by, by, by those folks. I don't know if they do contact local officials, I'm not sure, but I'm making my rounds through members of Congress, but I hope that that's, I'm, just, I'm not alone in that effort because my constituents are also the mayor's constituents. And so we need to kind of work together on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly pass that on. I know um, from my limited awareness of sort of how things are going in Washington that lately the ACA um, has been, um, you know, usurped attention from infrastructure spending. And it may just be a matter of headspace in Washington focused on healthcare versus infrastructure. and. They may be coming around. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will not get distracted by uh, Trump's tweets and other things. I, we, we, we still have a lot of critical Absolutely. work yeah. to do, uh, but the, the Army Corps made it very clear that they did not have adequate funding to implement the full uh, studies recommendations from Jamaica Bay all the way up to the Verrazano. So, you know, they have some limited funds. And by the way, I do want to note at that town hall meeting, there were some short-term measures that they uh, were in agreement on that the city could take without the, 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 the full funding uh, in place yet with regards to additional sand on our shoreline with seagrass planting, planted on it to prevent it from eroding because what we're facing in South Brooklyn is major erosion, which I'm sure is happening in other parts of the city. And actually, we're having a hearing in a few weeks about erosion in our beaches. So. That's something the city can do now. It doesn't, they don't have to wait for Washington to act on that. But I, I just wanted to just, just to make, make, a note on, make a note of it. Um, question about uh, the voucher programs uh, that we're pushing for. Are small businesses also eligible for that, or that's just property owners? That would just be one to four family property owners. One to four family property owners. So if it's a large building they, uh, with, with tenants inside, because the concern is, will the clause get shifted to them? It, 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 will, it will be based on the income of the owner, and the income of the owner of a large building will pass the eligibility. No, no I, I, I fully I get it. Yeah. I, I, I understand, but you understand what I'm trying to say. I totally understand what that you're trying to say. That those costs get shifted. Yes. They don't absorb them. Yes. Um, it's sort of related, but um, one of the things that we are really advocating for is uh, kind of equal treatment of co-ops versus condos, um, because at the moment you can buy $500,000 worth of coverage for a co-op, but a condo, and, and it's that is determined by the basis of the um, ownership structure, so you have one legal entity, the co-op, which can therefore buy one policy, whereas in a condo, you have, let's say, 20 um, units, and each, um, and it's it's not applied consistency, but each could be required to buy $250,000 um, worth of coverage. So um, imagine two buildings that look exactly the same, and one is, you know, 10 stories um, and a co-op, and the other is 10 stories and a condo. One could be required to have $500,000 worth of coverage, and the other would be $2.5 million worth of coverage. Um, and we have, we held a conference in March of um, last year, um, and again in October to bring this um, topic to light and it has been, it's been in the works to address so that um, condos are not over insuring um, based on the number of legal uh, entities I, in the structure. I will say, and I, and I, I hear you, but I, I'm very much concerned about this issue because we, again, uh, Maybe FEMA and others are not familiar with New York City, but we have a lot of multifamily buildings, significant mm -hmm. multifamily buildings, and it just seems that everything is very tailored. I mean, I, I, of course, we want to help our one to four family homes as well, no question about it, but we're, we're kind of leaving out a big portion of our city. And I'm also concerned about our small businesses too. I mean, as it is, 
not all of our businesses have come back to Coney Island after Sandy. I mean, I'm still trying to help a, 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 an owner of a, of, a, of, a, of a beauty salon that still has not reopened since the storm is having difficulties with SBA. And I'm just concerned that you know, added costs are just going to drive them out. And you're going to see the end of mom and pop shops in, in these commercial corridors. Um, I do want to note uh, a, a, a staffer of mine noted on the Flood Help NY uh, website that uh, in the New York Rising program, I believe that there was some sort of study or some sort of measure to address multifamily resiliency affordability. But that applied to only sections, I think only in Gravesend, it didn't go to anywhere else. Is that, could you explain why is it only in certain areas and not others? Uh, I can attempt to. So okay. the New York Rise money came out of Gozer's program, and it was community-driven, and they could request certain programs, and so some requested technical assistance. So if the community requested the technical assistance, then it um, became available. But um, so it's not, uh, if you didn't elect for the technical assistance, then um, you may not be eligible. Got it, I, and that's, that's kind of what, what I was uh, thinking as well. Um, one final note, and uh, actually I have a, I have a question that uh, it disturbed, it irked me in March, but we haven't heard it so much now, but it's curious to, to hear if you've heard anything else. In March it was reported that the Trump administration intended to impose a surcharge on flood insurance premiums in order to pay for his proposed southern border wall. The budget released in May does not clarify this surcharge. Uh, so one, I mean, are you familiar with this issue? And two, if this charge is indeed imposed on New York City residents, what can the city do to counter this surcharge? I am aware of this issue, and I think it's been dismissed out of hand. Um, by anyone working on this topic. So I don't think. Um, so yeah. basically, Trump was lying because when he says that he wants to build a wall and he wants to make Mexico pay for it, in reality, it's flood insurance victims, flood insurance folks that, that, that he originally planned to try to pay for this wall. Yes. Right. I can't believe we're talking about I, I know. <laughs> it, it, is, it, it was brought to my attention, and I immediately contacted our members of Congress, and they, all, they mentioned that they, it was a discussion you know, that he brought this to their attention, but they were not sure where it is, but you're, you're hearing from, your, from, from advocates that this is not happening. No. And, I, and let us know what we can do to help make sure that it, it does not happen. It is really outrageous. Um, and the, uh, the final part is that you mentioned that you, ha you have been speaking with folks from the insurance industry about flood insurance in, in New York City. Um, and is there anything else that, did, did you hear from them about what measures we should be taking to try to mitigate and offset and lower costs as much as possible? Is there any, any feedback that you received from, from their end uh, that w we can bring back to policymakers in New York? Uh, no, I mean, anything that FEMA does to make any of their processes less arduous, right, takes, makes a process more efficient. So, and, you know, it's no surprise to FEMA, and they're going through a customer experience overhaul in response to the Sandy Claims debacle um, to try and streamline all of that. Indeed, you know, I've heard um, even sort of aspiring to kind of a Geico level um, customer experience where it's online, it's transparent, it's um, structure based, um, and so on. I think there's many, hopefully not light years, but there's some time between where we are today and where we're, when we'll get there. Um, but to generally advocate for you know, 20th century, 21st century investment in IT platforms and other things will support um, better processing of both buying policies and servicing policies when there's a claim. 
And when do you anticipate these maps? And I know that you, you, you appeal successfully, but when do we anticipate these maps to enter the final stage? So we began the process of um, updating the prior maps in 2008, and we got them in 2015. Um, we're hoping it doesn't take that long. You're hoping it doesn't take that long. So eight to 15 would seven years. So we're, we're projecting four to five years. Four to five years from now. Um, because the reason I ask that question is because obviously how bigger waters plays out is important. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, let us know how we can be helpful from the council's end because we want to be very supportive on that end. I think the infrastructure spending bill is very important. Um, and it, the, also the, the other issue is, is time of these projects. You know, as you noted in your testimony, the Staten Island project is st not slated to be complete until I think the year 2022. So making sure that these projects, and, and they're ahead of us in my, in my part, but making sure that they align when, when these changes are gonna be implemented. Um, does, w w at what point does the FEMA mitigation credit take hold? Is it when they, cer they, they certify the Army Corps project will meet their standards or it has to be fully built? 100% complete. 100% complete. Which makes sense because that's when the risk would be mitigated. Correct. Um, and has FEMA talked to us, uh, to the city about what can be done for areas that can elevate, you know, because of multifamily buildings, attached homes. I worry about these properties. Uh, what can they do? Yeah, so in August of, or September of this year, they will hopefully be responsive to Section 26 of the FIA, which specifically asked them to give us uh, an expanded list of mitigation strategies um, for specifically multifamily buildings. And so they're supposed to get back to us by, by the fall? Yeah. Are you hopeful? Are you confident? I am because I saw what was originally supposed to be the response about a year ago, and we said, nice try. And this is hopefully a more extensive analysis um, and, pro and therefore program. And we know that it's taking a long time because um, – they are looking at some case studies that are particular to New York, but aware that any decision made with New York in view has national implications. So they are doing the hard work of making sure that it's universally ac applicable. And last question uh, I have is, in your dealings with FEMA, are there people at the, at the decision-making level, at the top level, that are from or are, are familiar with urban cities in America? Because it just appears in every deal that I've had with some of these federal agencies, it's as if these policies were, were born out of maybe Idaho or Wyoming, but not New York City or places like, like us. Yeah, I've had that experience as well. I would say the new head of the mitigation branch, Nick Shufro, is, was born and bred in New York. I, he has a city bike um, <laughs> membership, I know, huh. because I rode home with him uh, on a city bike um, from our mapping appeal. So uh, he understands and um, is empathetic and wants to get to the right solution. Okay, so I appreciate that, and, and I look forward to follow up with the administration with regards to the infrastructure spending bill as well. I like to connect with the federal affairs team in your office and I know we'll be meeting uh, to discuss with Congressman Jeffries and Congressman Donovan, but any support would, would, be, uh, would be appreciated. And with that, I think we're done. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'd like to call up. Um, it was, yes, very important. Uh, panel, uh, Margaret Becker from Legal Services. Uh, Jordan uh, Shopley and Rachel uh, Eve Stock.
we'll start this way and work our way down where the clock should be set for three minutes for each speaker. Uh, one moment, just make sure the uh, clock is set. All right, you may begin. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Margaret Becker from Legal Services NYC. I wanted to quickly um, touch on the issue that you and Councilman Manchaco were talking about, about the Department of Financial Services authority over the way that flood insurance claims are handled and the way that uh, policies are sold. Um, I just, you know, our experience is that after Sandy, DFS took the position that they did not have authority over these. Um, I think that's unnecessarily narrow. Uh, while the, the insurance companies are selling and handling a federal product, the, the industry practices and behaviors such as training requirements, requirements for handling claims, uh, there's no reason that those can't be enforced. Uh, in the handling of those claims. So I, you know, I, I, I'm very glad to hear that you're pushing for that because there is no one besides DFS to complain to about these. And DFS takes the position, you know, understandably, but I think excessively narrowly that, that they don't, they have very limited authority. So um, the, the main thing I wanted to talk about today is something that uh, Catherine Gregg touched on briefly, but I want to really highlight it because it's something that the city can do right now, regardless of what the federal government does, to help homeowners reduce their insurance costs right now, and that's an elevation certificate program. So the reason, the reason that is so important is because of this uh, subsidy, and I put quotes around that term, that's currently um, available, or th the rate that's being paid by uh, homeowners in homes built before 1983 is called the pre-firm subsidized rate. That rate was uh, slated to be phased out during bigger waters. It is being phased out starting in 2013. Rates have been increasing 20, 15 to 18 percent. Right now for, and this applies to 80 percent of our one to four family homeowners in New York City. They're in this rate. Right now according to the city's affordability study, 76% of those homeowners are overpaying on their insurance right now. And the, the numbers are significant. We've worked with many homeowners on this. In the, the, the lowest amount of overpayment I've seen is $1,000. I've seen it as high as $2,000. So we're talking about homeowners right now overpaying by $1,000 to $2,000 on their flood insurance policies. I just spoke to a woman from Queens yesterday. She's cut back to bare bones insurance because she can't afford it. She's got 60000 in building, 20000 in contents. She's paying $1,600 uh, on that policy under the pre-firm subsidized rate. If she was full risk rated, she would be paying 500 so we need to get this information out to homeowners and we need a program to help homeowners get elevation certificates and it's something we can do right now without any government uh, involvement. And very quickly, I just wanted to mention on the, the Gillibrand bill, uh, the, the issues that Catherine Grieg talked about, um, you know, we, we definitely uh, would definitely help homeowners. There are a couple of very harmful things in that bill. There is a coalition of uh, organizations, nonprofits that work with policyholders that have submitted comments uh, that that I'd be happy to share with you. Uh, but the main issue is one: uh, the Jill Brand bill proposes raising the 
uh, maximum amount of coverage, which would hurt homeowners with mortgages who are suddenly going to you know, find out that they need to have twice as much coverage and they can't even afford the coverage they have now. The other one is to tie the uh, level of coverage required under the mandatory mortgage uh, provision to the uh, purchase price of the home rather than the unpaid principal balance, which is again going to shoot up the amount of coverage that homeowners have to have unnecessarily. And sorry again for going over. No, I, I, I will circle back very quickly at the end, but okay. next, please, thank you. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rachel Eve Stein, and I'm the Deputy Director for Recovery and Resiliency at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee chair, Mark Traeger, uh, Councilman, for holding today's hearing on housing affordability and flood insurance. Uh, the center promotes and protects affordable home ownership in New York so that middle and working class families are able to build strong, thriving communities. Established by public and private partners, including the city council, the center meets the diverse needs of homeowners throughout New York State by offering free, high-quality housing services. Since our founding in 2008, our network has assisted over 40,000 homeowners. We have provided approximately $33 million in direct grants to community-based partners, and we have been able to leverage this funding to oversee another $30 million in indirect funding support. Major funding sources for this work includes the New York City Council, the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, and the Office of the New York State Attorney General, along with other public and private funders. The center's focus on flood insurance and housing affordability stems from our homeowner recovery efforts following Hurricane Sandy. When Sandy struck, our homeowner services expertise and strong relationships with community groups in impacted neighborhoods allowed us to respond quickly and focus on the short and long-term needs of homeowners. Given congressional reforms to the National Flood Insurance Program under the 2012 Bigger Waters legislation, New York City's flood map update process and the need for homeowners to make crucial rebuilding decisions post Sandy, two things quickly became clear. First, that the rising cost of flood insurance posed major affordability challenges to homeowners in our coastal communities, and second, that there was an urgent need for consumer-friendly information about flood insurance. We documented these challenges in our 2014 report, Rising Tides, Rising Prices, and also developed an early version of the Flood Help and Why website to provide basic consumer information about flood insurance and allow users to look up individualized information about their flood risk. Over the last two years, we have expanded our services for homeowners in the floodplain, and today floodhelpny.org is a first-of-its-kind web platform that engages and informs homeowners about how they can protect their homes from rising sea levels and how to lower their flood insurance rates, increase literacy of flood insurance and resiliency issues, and connects them to related tools and services from the center. For qualifying homeowners, we also offer resiliency audits and counseling through the Residential Technical P Assistance Pilot Program. To participate, homeowners must meet income thresholds and, meet and live in one of the following New York rising neighborhoods. Canarsie, Gravesend, Bensonhurst, Bergen Beach, Georgetown, Marine Park, Mill Basin, Mill Island, Red Hook, Rockaway East, Howard Beach, and Lower Manhattan. Uh, we are currently in the process of expanding RTAP to Coney Island, Brighton Beach, Seagate, Manhattan Beach, Gerritsen Beach, and Sheepshead Bay. Eligible homeowners receive a free home resiliency audit uh, can I just finish this paragraph? Yeah. And uh, elevation certificate altogether valued at about $1,800. The homeowners are then scheduled for a housing counseling session at a nearby community-based organization to discuss flood insurance options and financing for resiliency retrofits. Um, I, I can keep going if you'd like. Or... So you can circle back to me if you have questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Jordan Shipley, and I'm a staff attorney with the New York Legal Assistance Group Storm Response Unit. Um, we were a division that was launched shortly after Sandy, and in the years following the storm, we've served thousands of Sandy victims across a broad spectrum of legal issues. Even now, nearly four and a half years later, we continue to speak with more than 100 new and returning clients every month. As a direct result of climate change, many of these people are facing the rising costs of flood insurance, as you know, and general homeownership and do not have the knowledge and resources they need to combat these issues. Um, as we've spoken about, many communities currently remain at a greater risk of flooding than they did before Sandy, and for many of the individual homeowners that we've spoken with, large-scale resiliency projects and flood insurance plans often take a backseat to more pressing concerns. In light of this, we support three main projects at the community level to increase affordability for homeowners. 
First, individual personalized counseling programs like the Home Resiliency Audit Program. Second, a revolving loan fund. And third, as Meg already mentioned, provision of up-to-date elevation certificates to all low-income homeowners in special flood hazard areas. Um, individual personalized counseling programs, first of all, um, have already been started in the form of the Home Resiliency Audit Program. As part of the program, as she explained, you know, they meet, homeowners meet with counselors and learn about the best flood mitigation options for their properties and see how these options can potentially impact flood insurance premiums. We recommend this community-based organization model, which the vast majority of homeowners seem to prefer and which has already been met with enthusiasm because, as we all know, a lot of homeowners have lost faith in the city's ability to take their homes, families, and finances out of harm's way. Our second suggestion is the creation of a revolving loan fund to assist homeowners in completing certain mitigation projects. In our experience and in our work with the Home Resiliency Audit Program, um, we found that homeowners want to protect their homes from future flooding damage, but as we all know, Sandy crippled a lot of communities and left homeowners with little or no savings to pay for costly improvements. Um, with, some o with some oversight by the city, a revolving loan fund could finance homeowners who might not qualify for traditional loan options. Um, and finally, to kind of piggyback off of what Meg said, we strongly believe that providing elevation certificates to low-income homeowners um, has myriad benefits. Time and again, we meet with people, you know, as we have spoken about, who have been misrated or improperly insured, and if we get them a free elevation certificate, they can then turn around and take that to their flood insurance companies and say, look, I deserve a lower rate. And we think that's obviously, um, would obviously be a huge advantage for homeowners in New York City. Um, so, you know, we think these are three really good proposals that can be implemented pretty quickly and relatively easily by the city of New York. So we would urge them to consider all of these things. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And in the interest of time, because we do, my colleagues and I have to vote on a budget very soon. But uh, this is very, very important and uh, meaningful testimony. Really important. I uh, really appreciate this. I'm very curious to hear, um, you mentioned about the, the, it's staggering, close to 80% of homeowners overpaying flood insurance. Or it, that's that, that's rip off on a grand scale. Yes. Um, and you mentioned that one of the ways to, to, to address it is for people to get the elevation uh, certificate. Yeah. Uh, tell me, what is the process to get it? Uh, you have to hire a surveyor or qualify for one of the programs that, that gives it to you. So there are very few programs. Right now there's the, the RTAP program that, um, that Rachel was talking about that's limited to certain neighborhoods from their New York Rising Committees that selected that. That gives you an elevation certificate. There's a nonprofit in Staten Island that's trying to give out free elevation certificates. But other than that, people have to buy them on the private market. They cost... Seven hundred to a thousand dollars. They used to be a lot cheaper before Sandy, but now the prices. So the surveyor is a is that it's a private person yeah. or is from the city? No, a private private surveyor or engineer or architect can also do it, and they you know they use the tools to to so the measure the height above sea level. So the, the city can't do this themselves. They we need to get. City it. could absolutely do it itself. City has surveyors. Um, they have the you know all you need is a surveyor to do it, right? So I guess the question is who would pay for it? Um, but well, our people are being ripped off. Yeah, um, that's that's against our interests. And yeah, I think that maybe my colleagues and I will have a conversation yeah. about that. Um, so once they have this sort of this paper, yeah, then they go to their insurance company and say. You know, yeah, they, they need to submit the uh, elevation certificate to the insurance broker. Because they're not going to admit that they're, they're overcharging them. The problem is they don't even know. So, so this, is, this is where the, the dilemma comes in and why I would say 99% of homeowners don't, don't even realize this is an issue is because as the pre-firm uh, subsidized rates are phasing out, they're supposed to phase out until they reach the full risk rate. Without an elevation certificate, FEMA doesn't know what that is. So they don't know when to stop. They just continue raising it. The homeowners are not being told that, look, you might be overpaying. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a big black box. So, so the brokers, in most cases, not in all cases, are happy to do this. When the homeowner takes the elevation certificate to the insurance company and says, please re-rate me based on this, the homeowner then has the right to select whichever is cheaper, the subsidized rate, which will be cheaper for about 26% of people, 
and the or the the full risk rate which is cheaper for 76 percent of people so they have that choice all they need to do is submit it there are some brokers that you know I'm sorry to say this are so ignorant that, that they don't even understand why they need to do this and we've spent weeks haranguing a particular broker to try and get them to do it but it's a simple process if the homeowners only knew so well we're going to have to make sure people are aware of this, that this is very glaring. And the last question I have is, you heard my question to the administration with regards to when, it, when a home is elevated through Build It Back, how is the homeowner aware that they're now eligible for a reduction in their flood insurance? What is the process? I don't know. I don't know what they're told, um, but but I think you know it's true. They are given an elevation certificate, but whether they're told at that point that um, you know be sure to take this to your flood insurance broker right away, I don't know. We have so few clients in that circumstance, so well, that's yeah. you know understandably. Yeah. Uh, well, th thank you. I think you have given us some homework to do on our end, and, and I really appreciate this and. If my colleague has any other questions, uh, we'll go vote on this budget. Can I, I, I wanted to mention one thing to uh, sure. Council Member Chin. Uh, what you mentioned about a one pager, it's very complex, but the floodhelpny.org site starts out by asking the user four questions that allow it to then tailor the information it provides to be simple but still relevant. So, but, but I agree, it's, it's important, it's just difficult to do. And I should also add that we are expanding the program to include uh, free backwater valve installations for certain neighborhoods. So if we're talking about making these um, these retrofits more affordable for people, they're gonna some people will get a free service very soon. Yeah, we're gonna have to discuss some sort of an education outreach plan yeah. because I, I don't think I don't know if my colleague was I didn't was I wasn't aware of the staggering figure, yeah. eighty percent of people overpaying. I mean this 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 is outrageous, yeah. and it's only gonna get worse. Uh, yes. So, we have some work to do here, and I really thank you for your for your efforts and testimony today. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, thank this you. hearing is adjourned.